Welcome everyone to 2013. I hope you had a great new year and we are excited to kick the year off with a, another installment of our professional development webinar series. And today we are going to uh, have introduction to wheelchair lacrosse and we will be starting the webinar in just a minute. I do want to go over a few uh, housekeeping items before we get into the presentation. Uh, you are only tied into the uh, audio as a listener for this, as an attendee. Um, you are not going to be able to talk to the presenters. You can listen to the presentation over your computer, or you can call into the numbers listed below. They're also on the dashboard, uh, the GoToWebinar dashboard on the right of your screen. Uh, if, uh, if for some reason you have an issue listening to the audio over the computer, you need to dial in at a later time. You can ask questions to the presenters. There is a question feature on that dashboard on the, to the right of your screen. Some questions we will have uh, read to the presenters and have them answer during the Q&A session of the presentation at the end. Others will get some typed responses, but of course we will provide the presenters contact information so that you could, uh, can get a hold of them after the webinar and discuss any other issues or more questions you have in greater detail. There will be a survey that opens up in your browser immediately following the webinar. We do ask that you complete that to help us present you with better webinars in the future. And if you are looking for CEUs for attending this presentation, it is a requirement that you complete that survey. Some people do have issues where the survey does not open immediately after the presentation. Don't worry. You will get a link to the survey if that happens in a follow-up email uh, in a few hours after the webinar. So with that, again, uh, we are pleased to welcome you in uh, 2013 with uh, another webinar in our series, Introduction to Wheelchair Lacrosse. And with us today, we have the co-founders of Wheelchair Lacrosse USA, Ryan Baker and Bill Lundstrom. And with that, I am going to uh, turn control over to Ryan and Bill and uh, let them take it from here. Ryan and Bill? Hi, good afternoon. I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us today. We're really, really excited about um, this new sport and uh, being able to take this, introduce it to people all around the country and all around the world. We feel like we're onto something really good, and we're excited to be sharing it with everybody that is interested. So thanks for joining us. Um, I was, I'm a T6 paraplegic. I was injured in 91, the day after I graduated from high school. Um, I was in a car accident, driver fell asleep behind the wheel. I was sleeping, and when I woke up, I couldn't move my legs. I was on my way to go live in Colorado, and uh, did my rehab here in San Diego. And after rehab, immediately went to Colorado and lived there for almost 10 years. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit more, but that's where the idea for this was actually born, is uh, while I was living in Colorado. Um, and then, uh, Bill, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Lundstrom, a, a T7. I was hurt in August 2002, motorcycle accident. A uh, woman turned left, right in front of me, or I guess left, right in front of me. But uh, as a result, I'm a T6. I had a spinal cord injury and a stroke from my helmet. Um, you know, I've been able to, you know, meet Ryan and being able to go and be part of lacrosse and throughout that um, have my own business, uh, wife, kid, um, just, you know, do everything I can to, to get out of the chairs, you know, as best you really can, I guess. Um, so, to begin, we just want to cover the history of lacrosse. A lot of people um, I, I, you know, we want to make sure people understand where the sport came from, how it evolved, and it's actually the oldest sport in North America. It was used by Native Americans uh, for battle. They call it the creator's game, and um, the last point there you can see they call it uh, baga adoe, or to bump hips, or in Tawarthan, in Cherokee language, means little brother of war. and. In NCAA lacrosse, they give away a Tawarthon trophy, which is essentially like the Heisman trophy for NCAA lacrosse. It was modernized in the 1800s by William George Beers, 
And um, like I said earlier, it is the oldest known team sport in North America. Um, due to the geography of the or origins of the game, it became more popular in the northeast and along the eastern seaboard. But as you can see, lacrosse is becoming and is, has been, the fastest growing sport in the United States. And more and more people, more programs are taking on lacrosse as an option in their athletic programs. More colleges are offering scholarships to their students uh, and developing lacrosse programs, which is giving kids more opportunity to attend school and uh, creating more potential and opportunity for them, which is a really neat thing to see. Um, again, fastest growing sport um, in the United States, and uh, there's both professional indoor and outdoor lacrosse teams. Uh, I'm going to give it over to Bill now to kind of talk about some rules and what we did to get started and kind of how this, how this is all evolving for us. Yeah, and, and like Ryan was saying earlier, <clears throat> that uh, the whole idea came from when he was in Colorado, and it was appropriate that we were in Steamboat when he brought it to me and, you know, with the idea of wheelchair lacrosse, has it ever been done, and if it has been, where's the information? If not, well, why not? And so we jumped on the computer, we searched and searched and searched, and we didn't find anything for wheelchair lacrosse. We called US lacrosse to see, you know, what has been done prior to this, if, they're, if they've been contacted, because of course they would, people would reach, reach out to them to find this, and finding out uh, there is nothing. So we go through and we're trying to find the rules and, and the ideas of, um, you know, if we bring this to other people, is it something that is um, worthwhile and um, viable, really? Um, thinking about if we do play, what the venue may be. And, you know, if it's tennis court, basketball court, roller hockey rink, um, things of that nature. And so we get to that point, and now who are the athletes? Who are we going to be dealing with here? Um, you know, is it people that aren't playing sports? Or are they going to be the basketball players or um, sled hockey players or whatever? And we're finding that um, if you're in any kind of a sport, it's, it's something that's very um, it's pretty easy to get into. Um, Ryan and I had never played uh, lacrosse before before we got hurt and so now getting into it um, this is kind of a learning experience for us but over the last couple of years we feel that we're pretty proficient in the sport and so now we're trying to tap into the different player bases and try and get information out to you you guys to, to help bring that sport to life because nobody knows what it's, but it's out there right now and we get into what kind of equipment is it? Are we using something different? Are we modifying any of the equipment? And really, we're not. We're, we're trying to keep uh, all of the equipment the same. We're using basketball chairs because it seems pretty silly to be having a dedicated lacrosse chair when everybody's got either a tennis chair or a basketball chair already. Um, we try and determine when we're playing, what are we going to be playing on? Is it a basketball court or tennis court? But then tennis court doesn't really work, and, but we found that a, the roller hockey rink is really the best venue with which to play. And once you find out what that venue is, where do you go and find it? You know, we're throughout San Diego, we're, which is where we're at. Uh, there are a lot of rinks, but they, you know, the cost ends up being pretty you know, cost prohibitive to be able to go and do that. And so we're finding that, you know, we are lucky that we're using a, a county park. And so we're able to go through and play regularly without any kind of a, um, a cost. Uh, we get into uh, what the, the changes that we've needed to get into and then um, to establish some sort of a rule book because since it's not out there right now, we need to figure out the best way to standardize everything. Next slide, please, Ryan. 
Ryan? You got it. <clears throat> Thank you. And so now we get into, you know, the getting into the players and what our, our challenges are. Um, basketball, which is where I think we're going to get a lot of the athletes, you know, the season's nine months long. It ends up being really difficult to uh, compete with the, you know, competing for athletes. So we're going to go and make sure that the our <coughs> lacrosse season is, you know, opposite basketball, sled hockey players can come in and play, um, trying to find out um, what, you know, what the players, the, the playing is all about. Yeah, we want to definitely make sure um, that people understand we're not trying to take athletes away. We want to provide opportunity and give something, offer something different for people to try. Our season, when we start developing more teams and actually holding tournaments, will run from May until about Labor Day weekend. So we want to run opposite of basketball and hockey, want to give these guys an opportunity to be involved in something that might be considered a cross-training sport. Um, but we also feel like there's going to be a group of people out there that have been playing basketball um, for a really long time and are looking for something new, looking for something different. And this is a team sport. It involves a lot of hand-eye coordination. It's fairly demanding. And, um, it's, you know, we understand also that it's not going to be for everybody. Um, I, for one, don't play basketball. Um, and it seems to be the biggest question that people ask, you know, do you play wheelchair basketball because it's the most popular sport for disabled athletes? Um, and we don't expect to change that. Uh, but we do feel that once guys get a stick in their hand and we can develop some more programs, that they're going to become really turned on by it and uh, hopefully uh, develop a passion for it like Bill and I have. Right. And then <clears throat> the, the the players, you know, for the most part, we're doing wheelchair lacrosse, and we expect to be an awful lot of paras involved. Um, but at the same time, you know, amputees are going to be just as involved with uh, playing the sport as, as we would be. Um, so we get into equipment, um, reaching out to the able body of the cross community because you go and look at it, and uh, there's lots and lots of people that play, and so there's a lot of used gear out there that uh, will end up being available. You know, it, it's tough to go through and jump into a, a new sport when, you know, you got to pay for the helmet and all the pads and the sticks and all those things. It, it's really uh, hard to swallow. So hoping that we can go and get into other programs that have used gears, so we can get that out there to, to help people out. Um, you know, understanding that the gear is, <coughs> excuse me, it's not, it's not, it hasn't been modified at all. We, we, we're using the, the stick. It's only going to be, you know, 40 inches long, which is the attack shaft for able body lacrosse. We don't want to go and, and cut it down to make it, easier because then nobody quite uh, understands where we're coming from. Um, yeah, I guess, Ryan, if you have anything else that you yeah, can well, that, but it's kind of... As far as gear goes, we, you know, what we've been able to develop and through the fundraising that we've done up to this point has allowed us to purchase the trailer. Um, we have been able to find basketball chairs on eBay and... Um, you know, through other uh, resources. And then through our equipment sponsor, which is SDX, um, when we do our camps and clinics, we're able to turn around and donate here to these programs. And we, we want to maintain the integrity of the game, so we're not changing anything as far as the equipment goes. Guys have to learn how to push with a stick in their hand while wearing gloves. It's challenging, um, but we feel that safety is a priority because stick checking is allowed, and we're going to get into that here in just a little bit. Um, but we need to set reasonable boundaries with the equipment, and we need to make sure that we have space. You know, Bill and I have boxes in our garage and um, drive our wives crazy. We have a trailer that houses all of our equipment, and nobody pays anything. When people come to play with us, we've been able to 
um, function for the players um, at no cost. So we have all the equipment. We have enough stuff to outfit 15 guys. And if we exceed that number, um, we can usually reach out to the able-bodied community and get our hands on equipment to cover the difference um, in a camp or a clinic that we have. Um, so equipment hasn't been a huge problem, but we want to make sure that we understand it, we know how to maintain it, and uh, we know where to find it. Right. Um, in the beginning, we started playing on a tennis court, and then it moved to a gym. And like Bill talked about, we eventually moved to a uh, roller hockey rink. And the rink just seemed to be the most logical venue for competitive play. And that's not to say that camps or practices cannot be held in gyms. But when we move into a competitive setting, um, that will be taking place on a roller hockey rink. And we've been able to partner with different facilities around the country and different parks and rec organizations that do have uh, accessible ranks. And the one thing that we have found is ranks are not always the same size. Um, some are a little bit larger, some are longer, some are more narrow. But the general layout is going to be about the same. Um, and then when it comes to the amount of players on the floor, which we'll also get into here in just a little bit, um, there will be a difference in, in the, the way that the, the teams kind of adopt to and adapt to the different size ranks. Ranks can also have different challenges getting in. Some of them have little steps. But it's never been a problem. We've always been able to at least put up a little piece of plywood if we have to or just a little um, two by four or something just to help us get over a little crack. A lot of guys just get into the chair right onto the rink, um, and that's not been a problem uh, so far. Um, we've been able to introduce the sport to some youth, and that's been really, really a powerful thing. We want to make sure that we include all ability levels. We, do, we, do, we will never turn anyone away. Um, we're actually working with the Canadian Lacrosse Association um, and as you can see, they have a, a version that they're starting um, that is like a sledge type uh, program for people with different types of disabilities. So then if they enter into that phase of the sport, they can graduate up to a more competitive wheelchair version. But this makes um, sure that we're covering everyone. We want to introduce the sport to everyone, anyone that's able to play participate. We want to make sure that we're making it available to them. Um, and then make sure that they understand that, you know, the better they get, they can graduate and get up to the uh, more competitive wheelchair version. Um, like I said earlier, we want to maintain the integrity of the game. As far as the rules go, we have basically adopted um, all the standard, you know, men's outdoor lacrosse rules for wheelchair lacrosse. We play on the roller hockey rink, and we play eight on eight, including a goalie. Um, there is the offsides rule, so when the ball is in transition, on one end it will be a five on five, and two players from each side cannot cross the midline. And it leaves a five on five or a six on five what, if you include the goalie. Um, we want to make sure that we're not doing too much um, to change the sport. We feel um, that there's a, a level of respect there, and uh, we, we want to really um, adhere to the nature of the game. And you know, on the and at the same time, you know, wheelchair basketball, uh, they're not lowering the hoop, you know. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to uh, keep the game, um, keep the game as real as possible. Um, as far as the the rules for the wheelchair checking um, or like the specs on the on the chair. Uh, we, we're just taking that right from the National Wheelchair Basketball Association rule book and, um, again, making that opportunity for chairs to be used 
um, for guys and programs that already have these chairs and, and have the equipment. Um, when we first started, our very first event um, was the Abilities Expo in Anaheim in 2009. And we actually were able to do a little demo. And it was really shoddy. And we were just starting. You know, this we started this in uh, February, January, February of 2009, and found ourselves a few months later um, doing this expo in Anaheim. And from that, we were able to uh, over the next year to develop a relationship with a group up in San Jose. And a year later, we were able to do our first camp. But developing social media, getting um, press releases out about the camps and the clinics, what we're doing, simple little videos on YouTube, our um, Twitter account and Facebook has been really powerful for us um, just in getting out the information and showing people what we're doing. Um, reaching out to regional disabled sports programs, the able-bodied community, trying to find facilities and partnering with people, all the local volunteers that have been helping us, um, and obviously trying to make way for local fundraising um, in, the, in those communities. Uh, we've been able to develop partnerships with different companies in the lacrosse community. I mentioned SPX. They are the official equipment supplier of Wheelchair Lacrosse USA. They um, help us with all the sticks and pads and gear that we need to conduct our clinics and uh, make sure that these programs get equipment. Melrose Wheelchairs has actually developed a chair for lacrosse. It, it has all the same specs, but they're, they, they're excited enough about what we're doing to uh, to be involved, and and uh, they're they're actually you know really excited about what we're doing and, and seeing seeing this grow. So um, they've they're developing a chair, um, a basketball chair, but you know they're calling it a lacrosse chair. So that's that's exciting just to know that Rojo's been a big supporter as as much as uh, you know as far as cushions and um, you know their involvement in the community is just really, really outrageous. And so we're thrilled to have their support and uh, love all the people there at Rojo. Adrenaline is a local uh, company, lacrosse company here in San Diego that we're fortunate enough to have relationships with. And um, they're like a lacrosse lifestyle leisure apparel company. They make hats and t-shirts. And they also do lacrosse camps. It's a multifaceted business. And so they've been a really big supporter uh, of what we're doing. Um, these are, uh, this is a little list of some of the media that we've had. This is just a short list. Um, we can make sure that everybody gets these links so they can see some of the press and some of the different things that we've done and uh, some of the different people that have been covering us and the growth and what we're doing. Um, I mentioned before Canadian Lacrosse Association and uh, they are actually taking on their own national program and we'll be developing teams uh, in, in all the provinces across Canada here in the next year or two. And um, they're really excited about what we're doing and um, have been taking cues from us about how to get started, which is really exciting. Um, we have a full itinerary and a features and detail list. Um, this is an example of one of the press releases that went out for our camp in Atlanta where we had uh, 23 people from four different states, and um, we want people to understand our goal. You know, we got to find coaching. Um, we give away goodie bags. We do not charge for any of the camps or clinics that we've done. And then we also, like Bill mentioned before, reach out to those local lacrosse organizations and help get equipment procurement. Try and find helmets and develop relationships with that facility so this that team has a place to play. Um, this is a, a small list of the, or this is the list actually of the camps that we've been able to do up to this point. Like I mentioned before, the Abilities Expo in 2009. Um, we've actually been to San Jose twice. Um, we've been to LA, drove up to LA and did a, a program for the Rancho guys, uh, Richmond, Virginia. And um, in the summer of 2011, 
we were invited to go to Canada and do a demo at the Iroquois Nation um, facility on the reservation and uh, played a demo match against their under-19 national team and uh, put all those guys in wheelchairs and they played against us and did the same thing up in Brampton, Ontario during the same weekend uh, with a group up there. And uh, Canada is just super psyched and they're just a hotbed and so much talent up there. And uh, we feel like there's a lot of opportunity. Um, Atlanta and then uh, Denver just this past summer. So um, we feel really good about what we've, been, what we've been able to do in the time that we've been doing this. And um, Richmond and Atlanta and Denver are both, are all three really um, strong programs and building teams. And uh, we're looking forward to a good future with those guys. These are the programs, um, San Diego, uh, Atlanta. Uh, the team in Colorado already has their logo and their team uh, name. Uh, there's a, the group in Richmond, Virginia, the Sportable group. And then from the camp in Atlanta, we did have um, a handful of guys that came from both Fort Stewart and Fort Benning, Wounded Warrior guys. And both of those bases are using uh, lacrosse and uh, wheelchair lacrosse for their vets. Um, and they're developing programs there, which is incredibly exciting. And uh, I did mention Canadian Lacrosse Association. And at some point, you know, we hope to develop a, a national team and uh, maybe go to Canada or invite those guys down and, and really introduce and roll, roll out a, uh, a national program. Um, our goals uh, for the short term include um, continuing to create more teams across the country. Um, we need support. We need to raise money to make all these things happen. We want to continue to create awareness about what we're doing and um, continue to establish the relationships with these different companies to make sure that everybody has equipment and gear. And whether those come through sponsorships um, or whether they come through just donations in kind, um, our goal is to make sure that everybody has what they need to develop their program. And even if that comes through different college programs. Um, this is a list of the events that we have coming up in 2013. Um, the Federation of International Lacrosse Women's World Championships in July um, that is not firm, but we have been invited for that. And again, just really excited about the attention that we're getting on that level um, and really feel like we can leverage that support to introduce this game and, and what we're doing to players and organizations all over the world. Um, we're looking to have our very first tournament in Ocean City, Maryland during the Ocean City Lacrosse Classic in August. It's a huge able-bodied lacrosse tournament. They have over 100 teams. Um, it's the, one of the longest running, most prestigious lacrosse tournaments in the country. And we've been contacted by them. And they would like to host a wheelchair lacrosse division uh, for their tournament. So we're looking forward to doing that and then hopefully also setting off uh, our own WLUSA national tournament um, sometime in September and invite the teams that are currently in existence and uh, have our own very first tournament. We need to continue making appeals for support by reaching out to people like yourselves who want to see this grow, who see this as an opportunity for their group of athletes or uh, people in the community to be involved in something new and something different. And we need to have ambassadors on the ground in these different areas to kind of help promote what we're doing. Um, we need to create enthusiasm about the sport. You know, we need to share with people that it is the fastest growing sport in the country and that uh, more and more people are recognizing it as a legitimate op uh, option for them uh, to recreate or to compete and uh, just maximize our exposure. Um, we want to make sure that we're developing relationships with these different organizations nationwide and across the world, um, mainly um, the International Olympic Committee 
And um, I've been told, you know, I'll, although I'm not sure if this is completely accurate, but we need eight teams worldwide to be competing in order to present this to the Paralympic Committee. And there is no um, able-bodied lacrosse in the Olympics right now, in the regular Olympics. So we definitely have an uphill battle with that, but we, uh, you know, who knows, maybe there'll be a wheelchair lacrosse in the Paralympics before there's an able-bodied. I mean, we, we have a, a lot of interest from these different countries, and it continues to grow. We continue to get more attention. We want to develop a, a better, more established relationship with the FIL, um, and we have connections there, and they're really excited about what we're doing. Um, unfortunately, this is not going to just happen overnight. Um, we need to be patient and uh, continue to garner support from U.S. lacrosse um, and continue to work with uh, the group up in Canada. And we, you know, our goal, obviously, is to make sure that as this grows and as it develops, that everybody's on the same page and uh, with the ultimate goal being uh, Paralympics. Um, this is our uh, contact information here. We are located in San Diego, like Bill said. We have a website, wheelchairlacrosse.com. You can reach us by email at info at wheelchairlacrosse.com. Um, our Facebook page and Twitter at Wheelchair Lack. And uh, if there are any questions or um, uh, concerns or uh, ideas, you know, we're open to, to listen and to learn. Uh, but we're, again, just really excited about what we're doing. We really appreciate you guys uh, listening and uh, being a part of it. I can't thank Blaze enough for uh, the opportunity to be doing this and, and sharing the information about what we're doing. Uh, Bill, if you have anything else to add or if there's anything that I've missed. No, I think you've done a pretty thorough job putting that together. You know, we've got some uh, questions that have come up. We yeah, we've got some great questions, uh, Ryan and Bill, and uh, um, you touched on this. You said you, you uh, one of the questions was relative to uh, youth in wheelchair lacrosse, and you said you, you've um, done some things to make sure that the that youth can participate, and uh, there's actually an existing team for 6 to 18-year-olds in the Baltimore area, and a question from that program was, what specifically are you, adaptations are you using for the youth? Are there shorter sticks, smaller court, uh, different rules adaptations that might also be used for youth in, in able-bodied lacrosse that you're using in wheelchair lacrosse? I think that the things that we would change, <clears throat> you know, from 6 to 18, that's a pretty huge range. We've got some kids that have come out to play with us that are 13, and they are able to go and deal with all of the, you know, full-size gear. Um, the things that we've done for the, the much younger ages are we're using some like fiddle sticks and you know cutting down some sticks to help them be able to help them push. Um, you know, I think at that level, I think keeping it in a, a gym like a basketball, uh, you know, arena is a, a good way to keep it small. Excellent. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And, you know, the, the fiddle sticks and some of the photos you saw in the slide um, with the kids were done at, um, were at a uh, junior wheelchair sports camp where the demographic of the athlete ranges from 6 to 18. And a lot of the sticks, uh, like Bill said, are cut down. Um, we do not use a regular lacrosse ball that we use. Um, when we're playing uh, the regular version. But for the juniors or the kids and the youth programs, um, we've used tennis balls or different little light uh, uh, spongy so practice, like little practice balls. Yeah. And, um, you know, the chairs that they have, you know, are, are <laughs> owned by the, 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 the kid or the program, and they all have great little chairs that they use, and some of these kids are phenomenal, and they're going to be great. They're going to be great athletes. You know, they are great athletes, and as they grow up and mature and get stronger, they're just they're really really talented, um, and that's where the future is. You know, and that's we you know we realize that, and um, 
you know, I, I always joke and Bill and I talk about, you know, if and when this thing does get to an international level, we're going to be much too old to play. You know? <laughs> and and uh, so making sure that we create opportunity for the youth is a, is a huge priority for us. How it's done and how efficient it is is something I think that we're still learning about um, because, we, you know, again, we're still trying to introduce it to, to everybody that we can and uh, sure. making sure that we get the youth involved is, is, is going to be a big part of that. Another question we had, uh, can a miracle field or a wheelchair softball field be used uh, to play wheelchair lacrosse? Have you used a wheelchair softball field? We have not used a wheelchair softball field. We've looked at them. We do have a miracle field here in San Diego, and it's a, it's a great surface. Um, the problem that we've encountered in playing in spaces like that is there are no walls and no border. Um, so if you were to play a half-court version, maybe against the backstop and set up a goal, um, you can definitely conduct a practice and do something that way. Um, but if somebody misses a pass, the ball is just going to keep on rolling and rolling. And uh, you want to make sure you set up a border or some type of boundary um, to keep the ball kind of in play. And we've looked into different um, uh, equipment. There's a company out there that makes like a portable type roller hockey rink, and they have these giant foam borders that you can stack and, and create a small kind of semicircle or, you know, one half of a, what a hockey rink might look like. And um, there are different uh, equipment that are available, but again, the cost issue, it's a, it's a storage issue, and a, um, you know, so when, when we compete, and that's why people really like the rink, because um, the walls really help contain any errant passes and shots on goal, and it really keeps the game moving quickly. Uh, another question we had, is there, are there any plans for a classification system uh, such as one that either basketball or rugby has? Yeah, um, that's a really good question, and we have not yet developed a point system. The, there's one in the work, um, it's something that our board uh, talks about, and um, we, again, we want to make sure that it is a level playing field for everybody. We can't have or we can't expect um, for the game to be played eight on eight and have guys out there that are just pushing circles around other guys. Um, it, you know, it's really interesting to see this evolve. Like Bill said, um, when we first started, I mean, <clears throat> it was on a tennis court, and we were throwing the ball back and forth, and we thought maybe there was a reason no one's doing this. And the, the more we got into it and the better we got, we thought, man, you know, we're both T6, right, kind of mid-trunk, no abs, and I, I played a lot of tennis, and there's a lot of guys out there with a lot of ability. And once they get used to dealing with the stick, catching and passing the ball while on the move, it is going to be something really incredible to watch. And... I can't even imagine the level of play that will be achieved at some point. Um, it's going to be really incredible. We have guys that really know the chair, and they know how to push. They've, they've played basketball. They've played tennis. They understand how to move their hips and their body, and they can, you know, the chair is really a part of their body. And then we, ha we have guys coming on and that we're introducing this to that are still really trying to figure the chair out, but they've had lacrosse experience, so they're really good with the stick. They're really good at handling the ball and cradling and, and faking guys out on passes and shots on goal. And it's this really interesting fusion of, of guys that know how to move the chair and then guys that really are experienced in, in lacrosse. And the point system probably is eminent at some point. At this time, there is no point system. Um, hockey, I don't believe, has a point system. Um, basketball with five on five, you know, we, we have eight. We do have a goalie. Um, we do have a 
defensive pole that is a little bit longer. It measures up to 50 inches. It also makes you a bigger target. Um, and it does make the stick a little bit harder to deal with because it is a little bit longer. But we do have guys that stick to that length all the time. Um, and they play defense, and that's the, that's the shaft and the stick that they've chosen to use and the length that they like. And um, so with the fusion of all this talent and with the, how this all is going to merge together, um, we do feel that a, a, a classification system at some point um, will be implemented, but at the current time, there is there, we're not enforcing a, a, a classification. You know, and, and we have able able-bodied people coming out to play with us. Um, and again, like we don't want to exclude anybody, and so for that reason, we have not yet developed that. It's in the works, um, and like I said, it'll, it'll probably be enforced. Um, in the next couple of years, but as of now, there is no classification. Okay. Um, have you had the opportunity to try to make any adaptations to the sticks for people with upper extremity amputations? No, we have not. Um, we haven't attempted that, and again, you know, it's something... Um, we just haven't been presented with that, and that's why I think we haven't really focused on it um, I'm sure there are different types of cuffs. Um, if there's a, a missing hand or an amputation of the arm, um, I'm sure that there are different types of uh, ad adaptations that can be made, um, whether it's both hands or, or one. Um, it's not something that we've encountered yet, um, and that's, I think, a big reason why we haven't put too much thought into it. But I definitely um, have seen enough <coughs> to know that it, it's possible. Um, and uh, it would just be a matter of catching and throwing the ball with one hand um, and trying to determine you know, what might be an appropriate length um, if something was to be permanently attached to the, to the left or right arm, uh, that type of thing. But, um, we just haven't been presented with that as, a, as an issue yet. Um, when we do, hopefully we'll be able to figure that out. Um, we don't have the equipment that would uh, uh, we have any equipment that would accommodate um, that individual right now. Well, what limitation do you have to use a basketball gym uh, when the roller hockey is available? Um, I probably that. We have the gym in the past, you know, just practice. Um, the, the probably need to be up. Um, you know, like the goal, we, we made a goal on PBC pipe and uh, purchased some nets on eBay. And uh, it's a four by six goal that is the same size goal that would be provided on a roller hockey team. Um, again, just to keep it simple. Uh, we don't want to drag, have to drag the goal off the floor and then drag new goal that we built to the game uh, back onto the floor when the hockey goals are provided and with the wheelchairs and in front of it and when the goal of the equipment uh, is challenging to challenge to do that. Hockey goal, um, you can have a hockey goal on the gym floor. Uh, always good. Um, and then whether it's a cinder block, you know, floor on the like on the side wall. Um, again, it's just about making sure the ball is contained for any bad passes, so you can maintain a, a good play. I'm sorry. Mirrored balls are a bad idea for a wheelchair lacrosse. Yeah, uh, so fragile is a is a bad idea. If you get the ball great defense, place that uh, had lock on one side and drywall on, on the other, and the drywall had you know ball <laughs> imprint on it. <laughs> um, one, one thing that I just want to mention that uh, I was actually surprised uh, in my travel with basketball to different uh, venues is uh, if you've got a college or university in your town, 
uh, you definitely want to check with their rec department because it seems like, uh, especially these days, more and more have indoor uh, roller hockey rooms on campus that you may not know about. So if you have a university or college here, you might want to check with them and you might have a facility that you really didn't know about previously. Yeah, we are trying to develop a list of available facilities by state for people so they know where things are and where the facilities are. Some of them are profit businesses, and um, we've tried to get our these different facilities for <coughs> like a weekend clinic. Um, our weekend clinic consists of a Saturday and Sunday um, six hours or so on Saturday and three or four hours on a Sunday where we cover the equipment, rules, passing, catching, uh, game play, all fouls, personal fouls, technical fouls, and by the end of the weekend uh, playing a full, <clears throat> full speed scrimmage. And when we do these different camps, we want to make sure that we're conducting these at a roller hockey facility. It really gives a better feel to the camp, and it gives the participants somewhere to come and it's a different environment for them. And when you're on the floor, and it's hard and flat, it's like pushing in Costco. You know, it's a beautiful surface, and really makes it uh, quick, fast, and. Uh, the, the, it, it, it lends to a really great experience of having the roller hockey rink available, uh, much much like a basketball court where it's real open. Um, our concern, and you know what we've learned over the years, is just trying to contain the ball when you're playing and practicing, so uh, it's not you're not jagging balls the whole time. Um, and uh are, are there any suggestions for altering the length of the stick? Um, and this question comes from uh, on, on a play that may need these gripping devices and have shorter sticks. Is there, is, would there be a shortening that stick as much as, as it needs to be for someone to play effectively? Um, well, we want to maintain the integrity of lacrosse again. You know, the, uh, the minimum length of the stick is 40 inches. And we're taking that from the table big side. That's the rule. And, and we've adopted that rule. Um, what we found also is that if you do go too short, it makes it a little more difficult to throw the ball. But there's not as much leverage on the stick. And throwing and catching with one hand or, or using one arm is possible. Um, and this might also go back to the classification portion. Um, and I, I don't think we would be opposed to making an accommodation for somebody to only use their hand, um, but it would also, we would also want to make sure that they understand, um, you know, the speed of the ball, how they're throwing it, and really make sure that um, they're able to keep up with the speed of the play and up with the chair. A lot of those quads are really fast and have a lot of ability. And we've had some competitive wheelchair players come out to pace in the camps, and uh, kind of awesome. And some of them have tasted their hands, no problem, and some of them you know, both hands um, had a little bit of grip, they didn't find that to be a big problem for them. The bigger problem is if, you know, that claws come out, that have the grip, and refuse to use the grip, which ends up being a big problem because it's all well and good to have a hand, so now is and so, you know, if they can go on the glove on, there is some shortening that we'll be able to do. But if you go and cut it too much, they can really big advantage against everybody else because we're trying to get the ball or steal the ball from them and 
we to look at the stick against them at times. And so if you cut it down too much, then you know they can just kind of carry it all the way to the to the goal and take a shot. Gotcha. <clears throat> Um, I think that's all the questions we had in. I had one more. Do you have any um, uh, existing skills videos uh, that people could, could watch in terms of how, how you hold the stick and push, um, things of that nature? We do have, we do have some videos on YouTube under Wheelchair Ross is our channel. Um, and we have some different um, game footage, footage from the different games and events that we've been to. There are a few different instructional videos, um, but we haven't updated that in a, a little while. And our plan is to have um, a small series where we do address um, the stick, the equipment, the length, and um, also getting into some different like general rules about the game. Excellent. Well, Ryan, Bill, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Um, Bill, do you have anything else to add? No, I don't. Yeah, I, I think I'm good, Dan. We really appreciate the time, and we really appreciate everybody taking the uh, afternoon to jump on and, and, and learn about this. We're really excited about what we're doing. Um, go to our Facebook page. You can see uh, different events and things that we're involved in. And uh, the website is in the middle of being reconstructed. Um, so there's an old... Uh, and an old look uh, to the website but that will be changed so uh, don't let that freak you out. We're in the middle of doing that right now uh, with the new branding and uh, just really excited about it and look forward to seeing this thing grow nationwide, giving guys the opportunity to get involved in something new and give this process a chance here. Uh, we, had one, we had one more question just come in, and uh, I think it will be something you'll definitely like to answer, and it was, are we attending the U.S. Lacrosse Conference? That's yes. The, yes we, uh, we will be attending the U.S. Lacrosse National Convention. It is, uh, we're flying out actually a week from today. Um, it starts on uh, Friday, January 11th, or uh, no, I'm sorry, yeah, the 11th, and then uh, on Saturday the 12th, we will be doing a live demonstration um, at the U.S. Lacrosse National Convention on Saturday in Philadelphia at the uh, Convention Center downtown from 12.30 to 1.30. And anybody in, the, anybody in that Philadelphia area or that part of the country that wants to come to the convention and meet us and see our booth and uh, see the demonstration, uh, be able to get a good feel for the game and get all kinds of information about uh, how to get a camp in their area and the team and build program. Good one thirty. <laughs> well, gentlemen, excellent. Thank you so much for introducing us to wheelchair lacrosse, and uh, we look forward to seeing the sport grow and see more opportunities pop up. Um, uh, hopefully, I left uh, the slide up there with their contact information long enough for everybody to get it. If you didn't. I will be emailing out a PDF of the of the webinar that will have that on there and their contact information. And just a reminder, you will have a survey that opens up once you close out of the webinar. Please take some time to answer that uh, to help us help uh, bring you better, bigger and better webinars. And with that, we thank you. Once again, Ryan, Bill, thank you. Happy New Year to everyone, and we look forward to a great 2013. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.